بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته جزاكم الله خير for coming um, so الحمد لله our talk today is on jinn and black magic or jinn and magic as we should call it um, بارك الله فيك for all of you to attend this event um, Brother Abu Nadir, he's come from some far, somewhere away uh, to deliver this talk to us. So please let's pay uh, attention to what he's saying um, because it's of utmo utmost importance. Um, inshallah, Brother Abu Nadir, alhamdulillah, he's been uh, a Raqi. He's been in the field of Rukia for some number of years, um, approximately 10 years sure. and, and more. Um, he's a student of uh, Sheikh uh, Khalid al-Habashi from Saudi. Um, and inshallah he's going to talk to us about how you know we're going to protect ourselves um, and you know some signs uh, of, of magic and, and, and jinn possession bi-ithnillahi kareem um, once we've done that inshallah we're going to take some questions from you guys um, and that will strictly be done via text messages only um, text messages and uh, text messages only so if you have a pen and paper to hand or you want to get your mobile number and mobile phones out now Please take this number down, 07946-914-968. I'll say it again, 07946-914-968. I will repeat that when we start doing the Q&A session. Um, please, please, please keep your messages direct to the point. We don't want essays to have to read through um, short and sharp messages for the, uh, the brother to answer. Um, and also, inshallah, we're going to have a taweez box uh, within the masjid, um, upstairs in the sister section and also downstairs. Um, so if anybody has one that they want to find out what's inside or they're curious or, you know, they have questions about, please just pop it into the, the box. And if we get time, inshallah, we'll try to open it in front of everybody to show you the correct method. Um, of how to open a taweez and uh, you know to show expose what is inside inshallah so without further ado uh, brother abu nadir if you'd like to inna alhamdulillah nahmaduhu ta'ala wa nastaghfiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyiati a'malina may yahdihillahu fala mudilla lahu wa may yudlil fala hadiya lahu wa ashhadu an la ilaha illa allah wahdahu la sharika lahu wa ashhadu anna muhammadan 'abduhu wa rasuluhu يقول الله سبحانه وتعالى في القرآن الكريم واتبعوا ما تتل الشياطين على ملك سليمان وما كفر سليمان ولكن الشياطين كفروا يعلمون الناس السحر يعلمون الناس السحر أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم واتبعوا ما تتل الشياطين على ملك سليمان وما كفر سليمان ولكن الشياطين كفروا يعلمون الناس السحر وما أنزل على الملكين بباب هاروت وماروت وما يعلمان من أحد حتى يقولا إنما نحن فتنة فلا تكفر فيتعلمون منهما ما يفرقون به بين المرء وزوجه وما هم بضارين به من أحد إلا بإذن الله وما هم بضارين به من أحد إلا بإذن الله ويتعلمون ما يضرهم ولا ينفعهم ولقد علموا لمن اشتراه ما له في الآخرة من خلاق ولبئس ما شروا به أنفسهم لو كانوا يعلمون والله سبحانه يقول ووحينا إلى موسى أن ألق عصاك فإذا هي تلقف ما يأفكون فوقع الحق وبطن ما كانوا يعملون فغلبوا هنالك وانقلبوا ساغرين وألقي السحرة الساجدين والله سبحانه يقول ولا يفلح الساحر حيث أتى Zakun Lakhi brothers and sisters, you invited me here today to talk about an issue that is called, most commonly known in English as black magic, but really it's all different types of magic, black, red, white, whatever you want to call it, but it's evil. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about it in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 102, that we should not approach it and it's only loss. It will only cause us corruption in our lives, in this dunya and in the akhirah. And he tells us to keep away from it. 
And the story of Harut and Marut, and who are Harut and Marut? Are they angels? Are they men? Are they tribes from the jinn? And this is what the scholars spoke about. But the Rajah, the most strongest opinion, Ibn Kathir quoted, that Ali radiallahu anhu mentioned that they were angels that came to warn people from magic. They came to warn people to stay away from magic. Why? It's because at that time of Berbin, in the, t in the place of Berbin, there were men that came and showed magic to people. And they were saying they were prophets by practicing magic and showing things that were not normal to human beings. So Allah has just sent down angels to show them that this is magic and it separates people from husband and their wife. So that's the, the story of Harut and Marut. And that is what the confusing part of that sort of that area, that who were they? Were they angels? Were they men? Or were they tribe from the jinn? But they were angels as the scholars said. Sulaiman, uh, the Jews claimed that he was a magician. But he wasn't a magician. That's why the verse came down, as the scholar said, that he had a kingdom that Allah bestowed on him when Allah said, he says in the Quran, Rabbi li li munkan la yanbaghi li ahad min ba'di. Oh Allah, forgive me and bestow on me a kingdom that no one else will have after me. So Allah Azza wa Jalla gave a miracle to Sulaiman alayhi salatu wassalam. Same as Musa, he was claimed to be, or they claimed that he was a magician. And Fir'aun said to his people, bring me every knowledgeable magician so they can have a competition with uh, Musa. But when they came together to, to, um, to ha have this duel, this battle, what happened? They threw their sticks and their ropes and to everyone got bewitched. Everyone got affected by this sihr, even Musa alayhi salatu wassalam. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, throw your staff down and it turned into a snake and it, all the other snakes, what happened? The magicians prostrated to Allah in submission and they believed in Allah and surrendered themselves to Allah. Why? Because they had knowledge of magic. They were the most knowledgeable of magic at that time. And that magic was a powerful magic because it affected everyone and even Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. So what happened next? Basically, they got killed by Fir'aun, but they were believers by Allah. They believed in Allah and his prophet Musa and Harun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows miracles on his prophets like he bestowed the miracle of, to the Prophet وسلم, of splitting the moon. The Meccan people asked the Prophet وسلم, for a sign, so he showed them a splitting of the moon. But it doesn't, the miracles to prophets are not the same as what the, the soothsayers or the sahirs, they call to themselves, they don't call to Allah. That's the difference between the two. Um, so sihr, I mean, I've come here today, do I, do I have to prove that sihr exists? And I was researching, reading the books, what scholars write is the dispute between scholars. Does sihr exist or doesn't exist? Does it have an effect on people? Doesn't it have an effect on people? And it's a big, long discussion. But I'm someone who practices ruqya. I see people every day. And then I'm seeing why they're coming to me. And on the way, I've changed my talk because I'm thinking, what do people want to hear? Do they want to hear the conflict between the scholars? Or do they want to hear the reality of what's happening today? What is it they want to hear? So the reality of it is this. I'll tell you what it is. Many people are not affected by sihr. Many people are affected by ayn. That's the reality of it. But every time they go to a raqi, what does a raqi say to him? Oh, you have sihr. What does the poor person think? Somebody's gone out there purposely and affected me and attacked me. It causes them anxiety and depression. Just, just that. That you've told them that you have sihr. When they don't have sihr, you know what they have? Most, most people suffer from ayn. And the cure for ayn is very, very easy. It's very easy. Everyone in this room should know what the cure of Ain is. Everyone wants to talk about jinn. Everyone wants to talk about jinn. Okay, actually the topic now is gone. I'm not talking about the, all my notes now, I'm not using my notes. Everyone wants to talk about jinn and sihr. Now the brother, when he phoned me and he said to me, can you please come and talk about jinn and sihr? I said to him, Akhi, Akhi, please. Why do people want to talk about jinn and why do people want to talk about sihr? You want to talk about sihr, the Prophet was bewitched. He was bewitched. For six months he was affected. He didn't know he was affected by sihr. For six months. Can you believe that? I was amazed when I heard that. That for six months the Prophet ﷺ was affected by sihr. And in that period of time he used to seek hijama to get rid or relief from the effect of sihr. And it was a sihr to kill him. But it didn't affect the message. It didn't affect the message at all. What it affected was that he thought he spent time with his wives when he didn't. Until Aisha anha said to him, Ya Rasulullah, do you not have any interest in us? 
and then the Prophet Sallallahu made dua to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Now remember this hadith now, take note of this hadith because the cure for sihr is in this hadith. The cure for sihr is in this hadith. By idhnillah, watch this. He said he made dua after dua. And then Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala showed him a sign. And what I mean dua after dua, he made a dua for a long period of time. So in that that time when the Prophet would make dua, he went to sleep or he laid down. He saw two angels come to him in the form of men. And it said it was Mikael and uh, Jibreel. And one of them would ask, what is wrong of your friend? And he would say, uh, they, they said, Mutbub. And Mutbub comes from the word Tib. So the Arabs, they have a tendency not to say he's sick, he's afflicted, he's bewitched. No, they say something that is positive. So he said, Mutbub. Man tabbahu. Who, who afflicted him? Lubayd bin Asam. Lubayd bin Asam was a man from a Jewish tribe who practiced sihr and had knowledge of sihr, but he didn't have jinn. Okay, he didn't have any communication with the jinn. That's what the scholars say. The Prophet ﷺ was afflicted by sihr from the other Jews' tribes. They tried to do sihr to him, but it didn't affect him. So these Jews went to Lubayd bin Asam and said to him, can you do sihr to the Prophet ﷺ? And they paid him three dinars. So he practiced the sihr and he said, Lubayd bin Asam, the angel said, and how did he do it? Um, the angel Jibreel السلام, replied, a comb with his hair and a male date palm in, thrown in a well. So the Prophet when he woke up, he ordered in one narration, Ali and Talha to bring the sihr. So they bring the sihr. And this is, they say, the reason for Falaq and Nas, why it came down, is because of this incident. This is one of the, uh, the, one of the sayings of the scholars, they say this. When the sihr was bring to the Prophet Sallallahu it said it had 11 knots. And if you read, to read Al-Falaq wa nas it has 11 ayat and it had 11 knots. Every time he read a verse, he unknotted a knot. Okay? So, the Prophet Sallallahu it is in Sahih Bukhari, he was affected by sihr. So there's no need for me to prove that sihr exists and it has an effect on people and it affects on their body and their mind and, and, their, and their social life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders the Prophet sallallahu to seek refuge in him from sihr. وَمِن شَرِ النَّفَّاثَاتِ فِي الْعُقَدِ And from the blow when he blows in knots. So, inshallah, bin that is covered. And I think everyone in this room, alhamdulillah, understands this. But what my problem is, is that some people who are Muslim, not in this mosque at all, go to these magicians and they call themselves Muslims and they get sihr done to themselves. Okay, they get sihr done to themselves or they phone a magician and they say to him, what is wrong with me? What am I affected with? When the Prophet ﷺ made it clear, whoever goes to a soothsayer, his salah is not accepted for 40 days. For 40 days. And whoever goes to a soothsayer and believes in what he says, he's disbelieved in what's come down on the Prophet ﷺ. These things are clear that people are still doing this. Why? Because this message is not getting to them. This message that we're talking about now is not getting to them. And I'm not going to lie to you. I, I sit where you sit and I listen to scholars, students of knowledge speaking. But then I look around me and I'm saying, who's delivering this message? Who's taking this me message and passing it on to their neighbors, to their friends, to their family? Are we really passing on that message? This is just amongst us as Muslims. Are we doing it even to the other Muslims? We're not in a Muslim country. Are we doing it to everyone else? This is the sad thing. This is what's in my heart. Is to say, are we passing on this message? You know, a post, are we like postmen or not? Are we getting the message, the letter, and we're taking it to people's doors or not? This is the sad thing that I want to pass, pass on. So, the Prophet Sallallahu said, whoever has sihr done for him or practiced sihr is not from us. And the Prophet said in another hadith, whoever knots a knot, whoever knots a knot and blows in it, has committed sihr. And whoever has committed sihr has, has committed shirk. And whoever hangs something, whoever hangs something, he leaves into what he's hanged. I.e. when you hang a ta'weez on your neck, no matter what's in it, you are left to it. Maybe a stone or a shell or a ta'weez, you are left to it. It will protect you, it will do everything for you if you believe that. But it's all batil. It's all an illusion. And what's not illusion is dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's not an illusion. That is real. I mean, where else do you want me to say, you know, that people come to me and I'll show you. 
This is a family, a, a bag, I think it was a kilo. It weighed about a kilo and I only took some of it. Okay, this, what, what do you call this? What is this called? Okay, everyone know what this is, isn't it? This is a knot, okay? This is a knot. This person was ill, maybe affected by Ain, okay? And they've gone to this magician and he's knotted a knot for them. That's all it is. And they couldn't just open it like this. Bismillah. Okay. And this is what the talk is about today. It's to bring your ta'weezes, isn't it? Isn't that right? If you want to bring their ta'weez. But I bet none of you bring any ta'weezes because all, all of you look like, mashallah, practicing brothers. You see? Everyone here is a practicing brother. So the event was for what? For people that don't actually come to mosques. You know? Bismillah. So anything I read today? There you go. That's finished. Okay, now this sihr was done to this sister, now it's destroyed. She doesn't know that we just destroyed it, but inshallah, she felt something that lifted. So brothers and sisters, this is what the talk is about. And tell you the truth, this is enough for a talk, isn't it? Isn't this enough? Do we need any more? We need actually to do something about it. We need to get up and talk about it. And talking about sihr, is it the main issue? Or is it the issue of tawheed? Turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you understand? Everyone wants to talk about jinn. Everyone wants to talk about sihr and ayn. But who do you talk that to? Do you talk that to the general public? Or do you talk that to specific people? There's some things we talk to the general public and some things we talk to specific people that are practitioners on the field. But unfortunately, I feel that everyone's taking this as a show. It's like a, like a, a show. But let me tell you what the magicians do. The magicians, for instance, will will tie him, this knot will be tied and they'll make an issue of it. He'll untie the knot and as he tie, unties the knot, he'll pretend that he got knocked out and he'll get up and make a drama about it and everyone will get scared. And that's what sihr is, is to lie, it's to fall to deceive you. It's to deceive you. So don't open your ears to people that are there to deceive you. A lot of people come on, on maybe on YouTube or on the screen and talk about sihr or talk about ayn or jinn, but what is the, what's the intention behind it? That's, that's, that's the issue. What is the intention behind it? Is it to call to people to la ilaha illallah or to call to people to themselves? And that's what magicians do. They call, them, they call you to them, not to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, what are the characteristics of a magician? The characteristics of a magician, they claim piety and they claim that they are friends of Allah and they have the secret name of Allah and they have the ring of Sulaiman. They, have, they claim they have contact with angels and spirits and even the dead people they can talk to. But none of you believe this. None of you believe this. Say everyone shaking head, no we don't. You're basically wasting your time giving us this talk. Which, tell you the truth, this is what they, they claim to be. But all of you can see through that. But the ones that you cannot see through are the ones who come wearing the cloak of Islam. The ones that come and say we are Muslims, and they don't tell you the truth about them. You find them in mosques, okay? And they say to you, for instance, you are possessed and you say to them, and this is what happens to me when they come to me. People come to me, they say, I went to Fulan and I say, okay, what did he say to you? He says, I'm possessed. I said, why did he say you're possessed? Uh, I don't know. Well, how can you take that from him? I have sihr. Why did he say that you have sihr? They say, I don't know. So people are open to be brainwashed. Why? It's because maybe they don't understand the subject in depth. So do we need to talk about it? So there are signs and symptoms of people who are afflicted. But do you talk about this with the general public or not? This is the scholars that say, you shouldn't be just talking about this anywhere. Because you're putting fear in the people's hearts. And it's not my intention. My intention is to say, brothers and sisters, um, we need some form of awareness that these ta'weezes are sihr. You go in to these people who practice sihr, and some of you know it, and some of you don't know it. Like an example, in the bookshops, they're selling these books. If only we had it. They're selling these books. We didn't bring the book. Um, they're selling these books with ta'weez, and it's called The Prophet's Medicine. The book is called The Prophet's Medicine, The Savior. Okay? And it's being translated from Gujarati into English, and it has boxes and grids, and basically, it's a sihr. And it even shows you, it tells a woman how to make your husband love you and so on. And these, this is a sister who brought me the book just yesterday. And she says, she, you know, is this okay, is it not? And she had tibb al-nabawi. I said, tibb al-nabawi is fine.
by Ibn Qayyim, but this book is not. But these books are getting sold in Islamic bookshops. So all you need to do is go through the Islamic bookshops, look at the books, and if you open it, you find the grids and boxes, this is sihr. There's no doubts about that. Unfortunately, we don't have the book here with us. What else do they claim? The magicians, they, came, they claim they can catch jinn. Has anyone heard this? Has anyone heard these people that claim they can catch jinns? Jinn catchers? Well, these people have been deceived by shaitan themselves. Okay? I had a person who was a jinn catcher. He was one of, uh, he was one of the jinn catchers. What they do is they, um, they, they read on somebody and then the jinn will speak. And then they say, okay, I'm going to kill you or whatever they say to them. And then they say, we got rid of him, but now your body's empty. We can call any other jinn into your body. Now, how did they get this information? I know exactly how they got that information. They got it from another shaitan that taught them this, who pretended to become a Muslim. He said, oh, I'm a Muslim now. But look, if you do this, and nothing, nothing's haram. Nothing seems haram here. Everything seems like it's legal. They said to him, look, if you just now, the body's empty, and you make that person make dua. So I make him make dua that this jinn in this body comes into you. So you, and they that actually told me, they said to me, we prove it, make dua that this jinn comes into you. And I'm like, I'm not making that dua. Oh, am I stupid? Why am I going to make that dua? That's done. I'm going to put oppression on myself. But the jinn knew that at a certain time of the day, a dua can be answered. He knows shayateen have knowledge. Did you know that shayateen have knowledge? Everyone knows that shayateen have knowledge. They taught Abu Huraira Ayat al-Kursi. Didn't they, didn't they do that? So these jinns, basically what they've done, they've whispered in these brothers, you know, who have been mis misled and thinking they can catch a jinn. They can't catch a jinn. This is another branch of bewitchment and lying to people. Um, so they claim they can catch jinn. Uh, what do they look like? They can come from all walks of life. They can come from different races and religions. They can be young or old. It doesn't matter how old they are. They can be female or male. Uh, they can wear any clothing. So they can wear black, white, any clothing. Each magician, for some reason or another, wears a certain type of clothing. Sometimes they wear a special ring or a scarf just to show allegiance to a certain tribe of the jinn. Some of them, not all of them. But anyway, you can find them anywhere. You can shop, find them in shopping malls. You can find them in mosques, in synagogues, in churches, from anywhere. What do they ask you for? They ask you for your name and your mother's name. Who knows all of this? Everyone knows this, yes? Everyone here knows they ask you for your name and your mother's name. Like I said, all of you have this knowledge. But unfortunately, this knowledge is not getting passed on to your neighbors, to your friends, and to some other people. Now, I'm going to give you a story. This story actually is very important. Uh, and he's a brother who prays with us in the masjid. And if he sees my video, at least now he can take action. Because he can take the advice when I was invited to his house to see his mother, who was suffering from Ain. And it's not no, no problem. Ain, you do your ruqya, you do the medicine and the program, and inshallah you go away. And so what happened was, as I was doing ruqya to his mom, the signs were clear, the Ain was clear. But he said to me, I've got my son who can help you. I said, um, okay. How? He says to me, I'll call him down. But I knew what he meant. Basically he's saying to me that his son's got a jinn inside of him and his jinn can help me. Because I know this, but I just went along with him. So he rang his son down and he said to me, he's here. So I started reading verses of punishment. Now the jinn claims to be a Muslim. Okay, he claims to be a jinn Muslim. So I started reading verses of punishment. The boy's face started to get tense. And I said to him, you didn't like that, did you? He said to me, no, I didn't like that. He was only 10 years old. The boy was only 10 years old. And how did he learn this? It was another so-called Mawlana who came to visit the house to do ruqi on his father and then said to him, look, your son has got something special. We use him. But he wasn't using him in anything good. It was only evil. And his son now is still afflicted and he's not doing nothing about it. I tried to advise the son. I said to him, uh, the father, I said to him, this is wrong. This shouldn't be done. But he didn't want to take my advice. He didn't ever call me back again. But this is what's happening in our community. And wallahi, after Fajr, he sits right next to the wall and he makes dhikr till sunrise. But he doesn't understand. He's been taught something wrong. And he thinks it's okay. And his son now can grow up to be a magician. Because he's possessed by a shaitan. This is something that needs to be addressed. But people don't talk about it. Um... 
They'll ask you to slaughter an animal uh, at a particular time of day. These are magicians, okay? Uh, they'll ask you to slaughter an animal without mentioning Allah's name and give it to the Muslims to eat. I bring it to the masjid, give it to the Muslims, and it's been slaughtered without Allah putting Allah's name. Don't, not put doubts in you, that no one gets sinned for that, but this is the way the devilish shayateen will do. Uh, they will make you slaughter sort of an animal and leave it in, in the wilderness. So you'll sort of an animal, even if you say bismillah, some of them will say, it doesn't matter, say bismillah, but you've put it in the wilderness, that no one's going to eat it, it's waste, and it's haram. Um, he could also ask you for blood to smear on the person's body, uh, ask you for certain expensive bukhur to, to light up in a certain time of the day. Uh, they can ask you to light up candles of certain colors like red, green, and all different colors. Uh, they'll tell you to stay away from people for a certain amount of time in the dark or not talk to people for a certain period of time. What they may give you, they might give you a ta'weez, and everyone knows what ta'weez is, and they might give you a, a knife, a padlock, a ring, a necklace, and inside of it will be engraved certain symbols and numbers and these are sihr but unfortunately muslims are still doing this and they come to us with these things until they feel the negative effects and they come running saying oh we went to somebody who was wrong like an example a brother came to me just three days ago he said to me oh i wasn't practicing uh, i was weak in my iman so i went to this man uh, an african man and um, and uh, he, he said that he can get me a, a spouse so uh, he paid them sums of money and then afterwards, he felt like he had to go back to him each time. And every time he went back to him, he felt good, but he didn't get the wife. So he thought, no, this is, this is not a good deal. So he you know, tried to keep away from him, but he felt like something drawing him to, him, to, to this man. So he came to see me. But what was wrong here? What was wrong? He's actually looking, looking to get affected. He's looking to get possessed. And people do get possessed when they go to these people. They do get possessed. As soon as you walk in their door, or they hug you, you get possessed. Because why? Because your iman is not there no more. As we know, iman, uh, for a Muslim, when he commits a sin, what happens to his iman? It lifts up like the iman is not there. Until he comes back to his, to his, to his senses, then the iman comes back when he repents. But that's the reason why these people get possessed when they go to these places. How does one become a magician? Now, when you visit these people, uh, like these gene catchers, okay? These gene catchers got you know, trapped into this. Um, so when you visit these magicians and faith healers, uh, fake raqis uh, and psychics and hypnosis, they'll ask you to start worshipping Allah or to become more spiritual. And they'll say to you that you have a special gift and you have a strong energy. And they might give you a ta'weez to put underneath your pillow. And this is a true story. Okay. But I'm going along what's written in the books as well. And this has actually happened. A brother from Yemen went to Yemen and this actually happened to him and this is something that is documented in books so he'll give you a ta'weez to put underneath your pillow and then what will happen a jinn will come to you in your dream and he'll give you a, a jewel and then from there you'll start wanting to sin while you're praying it's very important that you start praying or you are spiritually connected so if you're not a Muslim they'll ask you to go to church if, or, or, or if you're not you know religious they will tell you to do meditation it's something that is spiritual so the brother, the same thing happened to him. His uncle said to him, start praying. And um, he got approached by this jinn, and this jinn actually you know, gave him this jewel. Uh, what happened to the brother? He started to grow his nails. He didn't even know he was growing his nails, until I said to him, look at your nails. He started to wear all black. He didn't even, he didn't even notice that he's wearing all black. Um, what else happened to you? Your nightmare would start from there, your nightmare would start. You will start thinking of sins of like adultery and incest and pedophilia. These are the kind of things that will give you what's worse. For you to commit sin and feel sad and upset that Allah does not love you and then they'll take you. They'll make you desperate. And then they'll, once they get you in that state, then they'll make you call upon them and seek refuge in them because they're the ones that are going to protect you now. You belong to them. So these are the things that they tell you to do. They'll ask you to disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They'll ask you to disbelieve in Allah. They'll ask you to stay in the dark for 40 days and they'll do some indecency to you. That's the reason why you stay for 40 days in the dark. They'll ask you to bring a sacrifice to a devil. And they'll tell you to do dirty things to the Quran, which I will not mention in this masjid. Uh, they'll ask you to write the Quran backwards. 
something that I missed out. The Prophet Sallallahu said that whoever knots a knot and blows in it has committed magic. And if everyone knows here, magic is something that you have to seek. It is knowledge. It's not something that you just get. Okay? But if you play around with magic, okay, you will get affected by the jinns. They will attack you. They will possess you. They will cause you havoc because you've opened a door for them. Okay, it's happened to some sisters. She was only 14 years old and she was in love with somebody. So she went into the internet and she downloaded a diagram and started to do a, a witchcraft uh, spell. She got possessed. And I won't tell you what she got possessed by because it was a nightmare. And the sister was suffering for years. She's not, not a Muslim, by the way. She became a Muslim. And even though she was afflicted by these enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This dunya is not worth a wing of a mosquito. It's, this is a hadith. The majority of this ummah will die between the age of 60 and 70. Whoever practices sihr, and this is the message to the sah sahara, male and female, that you've sold your eternity, eternity, paradise, you've sold it for nothing, for misery in this life. A sahir will never be successful. The sahir will never be successful. This is our belief, okay? And they do, they live in suffering. They live in torment. These jinns control them. They don't control jinn. By the way, jinns don't have the knowledge of the unseen. These people who go to these, these sahirs, they want to know certain things that are hidden from their sight. I eat, am I possessed? Who stole my thing? Who made me hate my husband? And so they don't know the knowledge of the ghayb. And once you go to these magicians, they will make you work for them. If something works for you from these magicians, God forbid, you go to a magician, for instance, and you want a, this woman to marry you or love you or something of the sort, and then she does, what's going to happen? You're going to start calling people to that magician. And you calling people to that magician, you're going to get sin after sin for the sins that he's committing. The same as those who call to good, you'll get the reward for everyone that comes to that good. So these magicians are nothing but a cancer to society. It is a serious matter, these magicians. It's not something that it's not in our community. It is, they do exist. But we just don't see them. And that's why it's sihr. It's something that is hidden. That's the literal meaning of sihr. It's something that is hidden. It comes from the root word of sahara. And which, the word comes suhoor, is when we, we eat before we break our fast, or we, uh, to start fasting, suhoor. It's the end of the night, and it's the most darkest part of the night, I before Fajr. So that's why it's called Sihr. It's called Sihr because it's hidden. That's why we don't see magicians just walking around doing magic. They do it hidden. But they're everywhere. They're on the internet. They're advertising on newspapers and so on. Um, there is a man that walks up and down the UK. And he's a Sikh man. And he approaches sisters. And I don't know if he approaches Kuffar or not. But he approaches sisters. Okay. And he approaches them. He touches them. He says to them, I know your problem. Now this is she's only 17 years old. Um, he approached her and she was engaged of a fiance and she got broke up with her fiance and she was going to college and this man who was a Sikh approached her and said to her, I know your problem, I can help you. And he put a piece of paper in her hand. And that's it. And she, he locked her hand and he walked away and she broke down crying. This is her story. So she went home, about three days later, she ended up phoning him. But to me, I was like, how did he know she, was, she had a problem? It's because she was possessed. And his jinns obviously saw her jinns. Okay? And that's how they work. And the jinns, they work for this magician to show him that you can have anyone you want. So she phoned him. And he convinced her that she has to pay him £500 and rent a hotel. So she stole her mother's gold. Okay? Sold it. She tells me the story. And then she rented a hotel. And he indecently assaulted her with her own will to get her boyfriend back. This is what's happening. She was only 17 years old. Okay, and she was possessed. Another sister story is that her mother and her father were about to split. They were going to divorce. But her cousins and her family said they know somebody who's good at his job, Sihr. So she went to him. She was again another 17 year old. And this sister story will lie sad. And the way she's afflicted is really bad. She said to me that, and this is after a long sessions of Ruqya, like maybe five or ten. 
and the things she had was not good. She would get up and scratch the wall with magic. It's actually anyone that came into that room and saw, they would get scared. But the sister, mashallah, she does really good work in Islam. She's a really good sister, mashallah. May Allah give her shifa. Um, she said she went to this magician because I said to her, you have to tell me what happened. You have to tell me. So she said she went to this magician, he made her drink alcohol. And then he indecently assaulted her and that's when she got possessed by these jinns. So this is what's happening in, in London, let alone in the other countries. Sihr can affect many things. Sihr of separation, Sihr of blockage, Sihr of sickness on the body, and Sihr of madness, and Sihr of murder, and Sihr of love, and control, and depression. And other things like adultery and misconduct. I mean, you know, these are the things that's happened on the streets, but who is willing to, you know, to talk about this? And not like in gatherings like this, but talk about it with families, like, you know, to their children and say, look, be careful. Like my son uh, and his friends, they saw um, one, of, one of their friends who just came up from abroad and he was from Spain and he just came to the country and he was wearing a bracelet. And uh, my son and his friends, they knew this was not right. This bracelet was magic. So they said to him, look, um, you know, you need to be looked at because he was acting funny. He wasn't acting normal. So they bring him. And subhanAllah, when we read on him, we found that he was affected by jinn. The jinn said that he took somebody else's magic. This wasn't meant for him. So magic, you can be affected by magic even if it wasn't meant for you. It could be done by accident. But everyone, I want everyone to kind of remember from this talk, most people are not affected by magic. Most people are affected by ayn. Now I mentioned the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu about his affliction of sihr and how he was affected for six months. Can anyone tell me how to get rid of Sihr from that hadith. Anyone? Hmm? Quran. It's a step by step guide from the hadith. The Sihr? That's good. Okay, anything else? That's key. But before making dua, what's before that? Adkar. The Prophet always made Adkar. He used to pray Qiyam al layl at that time. But what is step-by-step -step guide? So if you were to meet somebody that was affected by sihr, what would you say to them? Go to Abu Nadir? You wouldn't say that to them, would you? I wouldn't advise you to do that. Follow the hadiths of the Prophet Sallam. What was it? To bring their ta'weed. No, it wasn't. Think about it. We mentioned it. The Prophet Sallam was affected for six months. I'm going to try and repeat the story again. For six months. Make du'a. Somebody said that already. Pardon? Destroy the, destroy the magic. No. You're going to kick yourself when I tell you what it is. Hijama. 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 No, because Hijama didn't get rid of the sihr. It only lessened the effect of sihr or the pain. Pardon? Continuous dua. That's very key, but before that. Ruqya. No, the person didn't do Ruqya. No. See, this is the problem. This is the problem that I find every day. People come to me and I'm thinking, why didn't you just do this? It's key. You are the soldiers of Allah, you need to help people. This is why you're on this land. Shaitan doesn't want you to help people, do you know that? He wants you to stay in the house. Maybe just watch TV, maybe watch football. Astaghfirullah, I don't believe you're like that anyway. But the first thing is to accept. No, first, no, sorry, sorry. It's to acknowledge. No, 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 acknowledge. He didn't, the person didn't know he was affected by sihr. He was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Pardon? First, it's to acknowledge. You can't. People who are affected by sihr don't know they're affected. So it's usually the people, the family, will say, "Look, brother, something's wrong. We, you need to, you know, you need to sort something out. You might have an anger issue. You might be slacking your deen. Something might be wrong in your in your income. Every time you try a business, it's not working. Okay, and you keep knocking on the door, and it's not working. Okay, so." The first thing is to acknowledge the problem. Then when acknowledging the problem is to accept. Second is to accept it. Then thirdly is to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember the Prophet used to make dua every day. Do qiyam al-layl. Okay? But so the steps of getting rid of sihr is what? Is to acknowledge the problem, accept it, then make dua 
on you make dua is you are certain that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer your dua. You have to be certain. Your family would know that you're affected. So if you're not affected, you're not affected. But if there's a problem in your, if there's a problem that you have, for instance, you've got an anger issue, you always shout in your family, well then, if your family says to you, look, why are you getting upset? What's the reason? And there's no reason for you to do, to get upset, then you have to start saying, you know, I need to make dua to Allah. Straight away. So the Prophet ﷺ, when Aisha said to her, do you not have any interest in us? What did he do? He made dua after dua. He didn't run to somebody. He made dua after dua. So when he made dua after dua, what did Allah Azzawajal do? He showed them where the sihr was. So he went and got the Sahaba to destroy the sihr. And that was the end of the story. The sihr was, why? It's the first principal steps. Aisha radiallahu was affected. She was the, amongst the Sahaba, uh, uh, scholars of the Sahaba. She was affected by sihr. She fell ill and her nephew went and asked a gypsy, scholar, um, gypsy doctor and he said she has symptoms of sihr. And they asked her slave girl and she confessed that she practiced sihr on her. So she was ordered to be sold. Hafsa radiallahu anha, the daughter of uh, Umar al-Khattab, she was affected by sihr. Okay? Now these are hadiths and sayings in the seerah that people were affected by sihr and the sihr is real and people are affected by it. But because of its nature, it's hidden. And if you are practicing, mashallah, it won't affect you as much as somebody who's not practicing. Barakallahu feekum. Okay. Um, pardon? Is there a special dua you make when you realize you have it? Specific dua? <coughs> No, it's, it's just like, for instance, if you, if you have a problem in your life, for instance, um, you have a problem with a friend, a serious problem, yet you two are very close, and all of a sudden, that you two seem like you're just being separated. Okay? Um, but going, see, what, what you just asked, this is what I do, this is my work, this is what I do. What you just asked, now I have to explain. It's usually there's a drive before sihr, there's a drive, and that drive is envy. And the envy, you don't really need sihr to affect the person. It affects them straight away. So what the envious person does, he's not patient with his envy. This is how envious he is. He goes to a magician to do sihr. But his envy was enough. Because the envious one, shayateen follow him. And they use his envy to attack you. Does that make sense? Does anyone understand that? Yeah? In, in answer my question, you make that specific dua, oh Allah, what is wrong with my situation? You ask Allah, you know, oh Allah, show me a sign, show me something. There's not a specific dua, for instance, in the hadith or the sunnah concerning sihr. There's ruqya that you read, Surah Al-Baqarah, for instance. Okay, that came, that the batala, they lay the batala, that the magicians could not fight with it, could not come close to it. Barak Sorry, brother. Uh, just to... Um can we, can, I, can we give the brother the time to finish his uh, um, lecture? And inshallah, we'll take all the questions from him. Because otherwise, he may sort of forget a few points which may be important to us, inshallah. I'll, we'll leave him and we'll be taking, inshallah, the questions straight up to it, inshallah. Okay, Barakallahu Okay, so, no, it's okay. Um, this is what I actually do. I do workshops. I don't do talks like I'm a scholar because I'm only a raqi. Just that to be clear. Okay, we all, I'm all the same as everyone, so... Um, what are the signs and symptoms? Now the signs and symptoms of sihr are different to the signs and symptoms of fa'in and jinn possession, but they're very similar. I'm not going to tell you them what sihr is, I'm going to talk about them generally. Okay? Um, seeing animals in your dream. Okay? Um, seeing black cats. This is what the Raqis have come, all come together. This research has been done for years and years, and they've come to the conclusion that most people are affected by sihr or ayn or jinn possession, they see these things in their dream. Black cats, black dogs, lizards and snakes and scorpions. Please do not panic and run out of this room if, we, uh, if you see these things. It doesn't mean that you have sihr if you see these, because there's, there's different meanings for each thing, okay? Uh, scorpions and all types of reptiles. Seeing spiders and ants. Seeing demons and jinns and ghosts. Figures of people without faces. Seeing people with masks. Seeing them very tall or very short. Some people say they see them in a smoky color body form. Uh, and they look very scary. And having nightmares, okay, is all a sign of somebody that might be afflicted. Fighting with individuals, seeing yourself intimate with a stranger frequently, or being raped, and the person who witnesses this wakes up distressed. This is usually, could be 
uh, anyone, it could be male or female. This could be from uh, opposite genders or even the same. Um, so seeing these dreams, like give an example, like a snake, in books that are written on the subject, Ruqya, if you see a snake, that means you have uh, sihr. That's not true. If you see a, s a snake, it could mean that you don't pray. It could mean that you have a debt. And this is more a subject for people who interpret dreams, uh, not for Faraqis, but it's a general kind of, for us, it's a sign, an indication that other symptoms go along with it. So there's other symptoms during the day and there are symptoms when you're asleep and so on. Signs and symptoms during a sleep. Um, insomnia, can't go to sleep. Uh, when you're just about to go to sleep, you just feel like you're fully awake. Okay? And that doesn't mean that you're possessed if you get this. You might be stressed out from work. You might be excited about something tomorrow, the next day um, and things like that. So, or in debt or focusing on a project. Um, sleep paralysis. Now, sleep paralysis is a really... Um, interesting one. See, perhaps a lot of people suffer from this and they complain about it. But it doesn't mean that you're constantly possessed. It can mean something's passing by, possessed you for a time and then left you. Or it can mean that jinn's entered you or is there and it, it, that's the way it enjoys itself with you. It just causes you a sleep paralysis. Disturbed sleep is another sign. Uh, finding, finding it hard to get out of bed in the morning. Uh, physical uh, symptoms are tightness of the chest, anxiety, feeling tired during, uh, during the day, headaches uh, with no medical cause. Unexplainable bruises is another sign. Scratches on the body and sometimes names are scratched on the body. Sometimes the jinn wants you to know he's there. Yeah, they write their names, they will tell you their name. Um, which is quite strange. Or sometimes people wake up with a different color hand tone. The, color is, the hand of his will wake up and they'll say that it's henna and it's sometimes brown. Physical, physical symptoms, uh, pins and needles for no medical reasons, hot and cold flushes, excessive sweating, feeling something move in the stomach, move, movement in the pelvic floor for women, unexplainable pain in the womb, feeling pain while being intimate with the husband is another sign. Signs and symptoms in behavior, Sudden mood swings, unexplainable anger, uh, anger for the smallest of things, spending a long time in the bathroom talking to oneself, lack of hygiene, not showering and not being clean. Severe with swears is another sign. Negative thoughts, suicidal thoughts, desire of being alone. These are all signs and the signs go on and on and on. But it's, these signs are not to put fear in you. Everyone can go through these signs and they could just go away. If somebody was just to pray five times a day in the mosque, make his dua, adhkar al sabah, uh, read a portion of the Quran, and inshallah, these things will go away. If they don't go away and they become more severe, then that person needs to seek some more attention, advice from somebody else that has an, an, an insight and understanding of this. Um, so, signs and symptoms in worldly affairs. Uh, ex extreme difficulty in education or getting a job or marriage or having children. Uh, unexplainable constant failure always you try to do something you're always failing but this could be a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it doesn't mean go and run to a soothsayer and ask him what's wrong with me that's what people are doing okay and that's why we're talking about it here today these are signs and symptoms not for you to run to a soothsayer these are signs and symptoms for you to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala these are signs and symptoms so you can call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala signs and symptoms that you must fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it's a test So how to protect yourself? So we mentioned eight kursi throughout the whole day. Read an eight kursi. Falak wan nas is protection for you from all enemies. Sihr, ayn and jinn possession. If you were to read falak wan nas, you'll find it's a lot of protection in it. Eight kursi. Uh, last verse of Surah Al-Baqarah. These are very powerful ayat that you can use for yourself. And this is what the, the Prophet came and teach us. If we were just to follow what the Prophet taught us, we'd be, alhamdulillah, in a better way. Now, the Prophet and the Sahaba were the best people that walked on this earth, but they still got affected. But, and they still were doing the afkar and they were still reading the Quran, but the effect wasn't so bad. Most people, most people, most people, when they get affected by these elements, i.e. sihr or ayn, what's really affected is their deen. It's the deen that gets affected. It gets dented. They start going far away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And that is the problem. This is the problem why we're here. They're looking for something else. The shaitan that's in them is actually telling them to go to a soothsayer. So instead of going to a soothsayer, know the wisdom behind you getting afflicted. You might have sihr or ayn or jinn possession, but what is, the, what is the wisdom behind it? The wisdom behind it is so you can turn to Allah and surrender yourself to Allah and call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Barakallahu feekum. And I hope that I covered nearly everything, I hope. That's what I hope. Okay. Um, you know, we were expecting we're going to have young enthusiastic brothers that want to go run around breaking ta'weezes. So this is why we bring some ta'weezes to the show. This is from one family. Okay. And they've done it to themselves. It's not like somebody done it to them. Most people think that sihr is done to them by somebody. But they've done it to themselves. This is from the same family. Same family. Okay. I'm going to show you. I don't want to show you anything scary. I just want to show you something that will make sense. Okay. So these are the things they give them to wear. Okay. Now, if you want to cut that, open it and show them what's inside. If you should done your, you should done your, you should done your adkar sawah al masah. But don't fear because it doesn't affect you only by Allah's will. Do not be scared. Now I was, I was told not to, um, not to relate any stories of breaking ta'weezes and what happens at a time of breaking ta'weezes, not to make people scared. So I'm not going to tell you what happens. So these are the things that people sometimes wear. We might, we might think there's nothing wrong with wearing this. Okay. I'm bringing you something that will not scare anyone. There's no sihr on this. Can you see everyone? No sihr done on this. But it's got Allah's name on there. It's got Kaaba on there. And it's got Allah's name again in all different, um, different writings. But what's wrong with wearing this? We mentioned the hadith. Of course it's black. Pardon? It's black color and you get... The trust, the trust, the trust, the trust in the item itself. Yes, that's, that's the reason. That's the danger. That your trust now is left on this. So when they came to see me, they just dropped it, saying, no, I'm not going to trust this no more. They left it. So I'm thinking, okay, I'll bring it. This is harmless, really, doesn't it? It's nothing wrong with this. Harmless, it's only got Allah's name in there. But this is something that's interesting. This is, this is a sister who was possessed by... Because what they do, the jinns actually make you wear these things. And they make you buy these things, like this. They make you buy these things here. This is from a sister... Um, I called it the evil within. She dropped it in a marketplace, and I don't know if this is true or not. This is from what she said, okay? And I can't verify it. She dropped this, and she found it at home. She found it back at home. She dropped it in the market, then she went home, she found it again, okay? A really evil, nasty jinn. Um, and how did she get possessed by that jinn? Um, she went back home, and they asked one of these soothsayers to help her. So, what they do, they put a muakkil inside of her. And from the young age of five years old, he grows up with her. What happens? He falls in love with her. What happens? He makes a divorce. And then he makes her, go around, makes her marry the wrong person, so she divorces again. Then she stays alone and never ever gets married. And the jinn takes her for himself. So this here, okay, is, is just, it seems like, okay, it's fa'ain. We don't really believe in it. We just hang it. Maybe it'll do something, maybe or not. That's, that's the way they talk. Okay? But this is shirk. You've actually committed shirk. And you've asked jinns to possess you. Is there any specific way why this is... I have a guess. There's no science to it. I'm not, you know... I don't know why it's like this. Oh, no. I don't know. This is a, fascinating. Like, it's fascinating. Like, yeah. it's just exactly how you just... That's normal, natural what you just said. <coughs> yeah. They, they want to make it fascinating. He could just fold it up normally, couldn't he? But... They want to make it like it's something there. Yeah. It's nothing, it's all bathing. This is another thing they carry, they put in their shops. But this all calls, you know what this makes, this does? This calls for shayateen to come to your house. Seems like there's nothing there, isn't it? But the jinns, this is what they want you to have in your house for them to enter. Remember the Prophet Sallallahu when he had a curtain and he had pictures on, the angels of Jibreel did not come, did he? For a month. Okay, the reason why is because they had pictures. In another narration, there was a puppy that was dead underneath the bed of the Prophet Can you just explain? Like... Okay, so brothers and brothers, mashallah, who... 
uh, who brothers are brothers and sisters. Very quickly, j the number we gave out earlier for the questions, um, it was actually uh, incorrect. My apologies. Uh, if you'd like to take the uh, note of the number again, it's 079, sorry, 07469 147 967. So all questions to that number, please. 07469 147 967. Barakalofi. By the way, by now I'm finished, there should be no questions because I've covered everything, haven't I? <laughs> I've opened up everything. I didn't read from the paper. So this here, the brother wants me to explain what it is. And I'm like, how do you want me to say what it is? I mean, who am I? I'm not the magician who wrote it. Yeah. So, no, 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 this is sihr. Okay, it's got grids and boxes. And the person himself who wrote this could be in possess. Okay, most of these people who are magicians are possessed from jinn. I'll give you an example of the writing of a jinn. I actually told the jinn one time to write, and he actually showed me how they do sihr. So this here, this scribbled in here, it looks like it's nothing. When we open it, we see it as nothing. It's just scribbled in. There's nothing there. But this is jinn writing. But I can't verify, I can't prove it. But this is what they say. Okay? So that's the disclaimer. I can't prove it. They say it's jinn. This is writing against sihr. And the brothers like to decode sihr. I don't understand why do you want to decode sihr. Do you know why they want to decode sihr? It's to find out who done the sihr. It's to find out who done the sihr. Why would one, somebody want to divorce that man from his wife? Who could it be? His cousin, the maid, and they, they look at the sihr and they say it's her. Okay, let's take her. Let's pr imprison her. That's why they decode sihr. But for me to decode some sihr that people went to a magician to get cured from a certain illness doesn't make sense, does it? Do I really need to decode it? Because they tell me the man where he lives. That's what the decoding sihr is for. Okay? Um, so that's, again, so all this writing is just, like the scholars say, mumbo jumbo. There's no need to read it. You just put it in water. Okay? If we have a container of water, we can just show them how to destroy this. Sorry to play this down, but this is what you're supposed to do. You place it down, you don't give it any, anything. It's nothing, it's irrelevant. Get it out of your lives. Alhamdulillah, all of you here, this doesn't affect any of you, sah? Am I right? None of you have this. But it's people that may be around you that carry things like this in their house or in their cars, thinking that they've got something that's protecting them, when it's not. It's actually calling evil things to come to them. Um, so these people, like I said, going back, they went to somebody to get a cure, okay? And that's why they got so much of it. This should be hidden and no one can see, but it's not hidden anymore, is it? It's out in the open. So it's going backwards, isn't it? Okay, Wasim, you said you wanted to break ta'weez and the people are going to break the ta'weez. What are you going to do with them? Okay, so now... When you have somebody like a neighbor who brings you something like this, um, I'm going to tell you a story. An Nigerian brother came to see me. Uh, this is about 15 years ago. And um, so I was in the musalla, and the brothers pointed at him and said, Oh, take that brother there. I was young at the time, I think. Um, so they, uh, they said to him, So he came to me, and his head was down like this, and he couldn't lift his head off. He couldn't lift his up, head up like this. So he grabbed my hand. He said, come with me. So I went with him, walked with him for a good 10 minutes. He took me into this house and it, it was obvious it's not his house. And he was renting from an Asian family. And um, I walked into his room and he had stuck on the, on the wall a piece of paper, like a notepad paper, just the size of this or just smaller, a size of this or just smaller. And it was a box with grids. And he said to me, he just pointed it, he couldn't even talk about it. So I grabbed it, pulled it down, took it to the kitchen, put it in water, but it wouldn't dissolve because it was written with red ink. So I thought, okay. So I put it on the cooker and I burnt it. As I burnt it, subhanAllah, his head lifted up from here to, norm, to normality. That was the end of the sihr, it was finished. So this is inshallah, what we've been, now this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna open one of these sa'awizas so all of you can see how it's done. Okay, can I have my, thank you. Okay, is the camera getting this? Okay, and I hope the brothers that are here uh, do not get scared to do this because your neighbors might need, might need this to be done. Bismillah. Is it written in English or Arabic? What, the Tawis? Yeah. It doesn't matter what language is written in, it could be even in Greek.
And just while you're doing that, um, someone just asked a very a relevant question. Um, that if this is uh, mumbo jumbo, as mm -hmm. you say, um, why do we need to place this into the water? What's the purpose? Of okay, it's a good, good question. Now, this is what the jinn say. Okay, they are attached to the ta'weez. Can I prove that? I can't prove that, can I? So, what is it? It's mumbo jumbo, yes. It is a knowledge, it is this and the other, but this is only to put fear in your hearts. Now, if you want to really believe what I'm going to say, this was not written, this was all photocopied. Okay? This is photocopied. Okay? Um, this was done to heal somebody, not to harm or kill someone. Okay? But it's all lies. It's making his heart attached to something that is not real. Okay? That per person can be possessed because of this. Okay? And the jinn now has got authority. You gave him authority to enter you. You've attached your heart to something that's not real. This is the problem of it. Okay? So now this just needs to be burned. This is really nothing. This one actually needs to be in water. This one here, Bismillah. You put it in water like this. Pardon? Do you, do you have to recite on the water? Okay, so do you need to recite on the water? Do you not need to recite on the water? The most important thing is to actually destroy this, okay? In any way or form. Why you're reciting is so you don't get affected, okay? So to be on the safe side is to read Falak on this. Why am I saying that? Is the knots when they're knotted, is you, once it's unknotted, once, it's, once the unknot is knotted, this is basically the science of breaking the sihr, is this is the knot. And if you want to break the knot and it's finished, is you only need to do is unknot it. And in the narration that Prophet sent him, he read every time he knotted an unknot, he blew in it with one verse. And that was finished. Now the scholars say it's to blow in the water, it's safe. As anything that I read today, and any of you who read today, Adhkar al Masa, or he prayed, he was reading the Quran, so it's still in you, in you. The recitation the, or during that day is you just need to blow in the water. And that's it, that is, the water now has ruqya in it. And anyone of you can do this, not just me. And once it's in water, you can just destroy it like this, or you can wait for it to be dissolved, but I like to destroy it straight away, because you have to wait for a few days before it starts dissolving. The paper might dissolve and the ink doesn't dissolve yet. So once that's done, to me, I believe, it's like you unknotted the knot, it's not attached anymore. The grids are not there, and that's destroyed. Um, okay, that's, the ta'weez is done. It's broken. I'm finished. I'm done. Any questions and we can be finished. I'll give it back to the to the brothers here and sisters as well upstairs. Do you want do you want us to go through the question and answers before? For, um, I'm giving it, well, putting it back to the brothers and sisters as well upstairs. Would you like us to um, carry on and then pray Isha, or shall we pray Isha and come back for question and answers? So we'll, we'll take a few, um, a few questions before the, the Adhan, insha'Allah, and one uh, between. And then if there are any other uh, burning questions, insha'Allah, we'll ask people to um, come back up to Aisha, insha'Allah. Okay, so um, one of the questions was, uh, how does a person feel? Um, what, what does a person feel when affected by sihr or ayn? Um, when a person is affected by sihr or ayn, like I said to the brother earlier, it, it depends on the person. Not everyone is the same. Everyone's signs and symptoms is different. It's okay to pick up a book and read it and read the signs and symptoms like I just mentioned, but not everyone's the same. Okay? You might have a strong character um, that, for instance, uh, your relationship with your wife might be strong. So it won't affect your marriage, but it'll affect another uh, relationship like at work. 
that it was intended for your marriage. So you start fighting with your boss. Do you understand? So if your marriage was a strong relationship or your wife was very patient, it wouldn't really affect the, the sihr. It would affect somebody else that you relate with. Does that make sense? Have I just confused everyone? So everyone's different. The signs and symptoms that you read in the book, it's not, just, it's not clear. So that's a, that, I hope I answered that question. Yeah. Well, um, somebody's messaged about something called uh, Nuri N. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know if you've come across this word. Okay, Nuri N, this is what they do. This is a, this is a ring. Okay. Uh, and it's got Khatim Suleiman on this. Uh, it's a, a charm of they, they claim it's Suleiman's what he used to have in his ring and this is what they do this is things they practice in places like all over the world to the truth but it's funny how the ring is on the outside that the, the engraving is on the outside not in the inside usually somebody will give you a ring and the sihr will be from the inside and it'll be hidden once you put that ring in you'll get possessed by a demon okay but this person he can be he couldn't have um, intimacy with his wife, so his wife took him to this man and gave him this ring. And he still couldn't be intimate with his wife. Not surprisingly. Okay? Uh, so this one needs to be grinded down and worn off. Okay? But the effect of this is when the person's wearing it. Okay? Nur al-Ain, yes, Nur al-Ain. Nur al-Ain is basically knowledge of, uh, of the shayateen. Uh, they tell them that we have knowledge that no one else has and will teach, teach you secrets of, uh, of Allah Azza wa Jal, like Khatim Suleiman, like I just showed you here. So this is what they call ilm. This here, this is this way it goes back to, down to. Okay? And they'll tell you to stay in the cave for a certain period of time. And then you have somebody that come to you. So it's, it's, it's the same as... Uh, any other type of it's magic or okay, okay. Um, somebody's asked how to treat evil eye. Inshallah, they've already got that answer. What's the answer for evil eye? Uh, okay, the evil eye. I didn't mention the, the cure for evil eye. Good question. Like I said, most people are affected by the evil eye and they don't know the cure. So what happens is they think somebody's done magic to them. The the cure for the evil eye is straight away is to know who gave you the evil eye. If you know who gave you the evil eye, you can either ask them. For their water, the wudu, and you can wash from that, and that will get rid of the evil eye straight away. Uh, but most people won't give you their water, would they? So what you need to do is, um, like uh, uh, Sheikh uh, Rahmatullah Ali Uthaymeen said, if they eat from a date, for instance, and you eat from the, the bone of the date, the seed, you, if they eat it and they put it in their saliva, their saliva, there's DNA, you take that and you put it in water and you wash from it till the affliction goes away. And how do you know somebody gave you the evil eye? They will say something of amazement like, wow, what a beautiful car you have. Oh, wow, what a nice dress you have. Oh, wow, how do you do your hair? That wow, that wow is the evil eye. Straight away when somebody says wow or any other term in slang, that you, you just now got the evil eye depending on how strong his evil eye is and it's not evil eye that's another misinterpretation mis, uh, it's called the admiring eye the evil eye is from the jinn or somebody who hates you mashallah yeah. okay uh, next question inshallah um, can jinns um, have a direct effect on mental illness um, Obviously, it is, it is a, uh, a big topic, but of, if you could just... They are specialists. Jinns the, so are specialists. Anxiety, paranoia, uh, depression, are these all related to gym possession? They, they are specialists in this field. Okay. They are specialists, and this is, uh, wallahi, this is what they're good at. Okay, if they can run through your veins, they, they're good at this, and we, we, this is where we find the problem. The strongest type of afflictions is this when they go to mental hospitals and when psychiatrists and doctors can't help them, they can't explain why they're going through what they're going through and we, you know, we can't. And it takes years. And even sometimes when people come to me, I don't believe they're affected by jinn, but they are. Sheikh, I mean, just, uh, um, I see that we are inundated with questions, mashallah. Um, and I'm sure there are some burning questions with, uh, within this, uh, this one. Um, I don't know if the brothers feel that we'll stop um, so we can do the, the, the adhan and the, uh, pray the Isha, inshallah. 
and uh, um, if the brothers want to stay after Isha, by all means. Yes. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, brother Abu Nadir, inshallah, if you're ready, we can just crack on with can the I, questions. Can I just answer that question again no. about the ta'weez? Um, I answered the doubt, you know, the, the ta'weez is only mumbo jumbo. Um, that's what, as Muslims, that's how we should look at ta'weez. We shouldn't look at it as something that is, um, something that is great or something that is, has an effect on us. Just before you, uh, with regards to mumbo jumbo, someone's asked a question and it's just reminded me, so I, I'm, I'm asking, what about the ta'weez with Quran in it? Yeah, the, Quran. Okay, so the, the, this is where, okay, thank you. Uh, so the scholars say that ta'weez that has Quran in it and it's sealed and it's protected, it's allowed. That's what the scholars say. It's allowed. Um, and, and I read the fatwa from the scholars, they say it's allowed. But the. And who am I to say my opinion? It's not my opinion to say it's allowed or not. But from what I understand, that Quran is supposed to be read. Okay? And the people that can read it or can remember to memorize it is to take the, the, the thing that they hanged around the neck and to read it. Uh, like we carried the Quran with us. Uh, that time they used to memorize the Quran. Um, so the scholars say it's allowed as long as it's sealed and no impurity can get to it. But today, many people don't have Quran on their necks. It's actually uh, grids and boxes which calculate to be the devil's names, certain devil's names. Uh, but like I said, the example of this is this, as we mentioned, if you hang this like the hadith of the Prophet, uh, hadith of the Prophet وسلم, whoever hangs something on his neck, he's left to it. That should be enough, sufficient for you to understand that you should not believe in anything but call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's it. The Prophet was given concise words. He was given words that you're supposed to understand straight away. Men aqada aqada, whoever knots and knots and blows in it has committed sihr. But we know that sihr is, is a knowledge that you must obtain and you must do certain rituals. And it takes time before you become a magician. Do you understand? But the Prophet وسلم, said, stay away from it. It's a save, a seven major sins that you stay away from. Don't come close to it. So, um, answering the question of what's inside the ta'weez, it's again, uh, it is harmful because it draws the shayateen to you. And some people believe, and jinns say, they are attached to a ta'weez. And again, this is not information that we've been told by the Prophet Sallallahu or in the Qur'an. But we know from the hadith that you, your iman is, is weak because your iman now is attached to something else than Allah. Um, a question I have uh, here is what can we do um, how can we address magicians uh, in today's day so for example how, how does one confront a magician um, and what can we do living in, in, in this country obviously what is the best method to uh, tackle this issue I mean magicians they're not gonna they, they believe they're doing something right. That's the problem. They believe that they're doing something right. They believe these numbers calculate to be a certain calculation in the Quran. They don't believe they're doing sihr. They believe that they are doing something that is good. And now you have to sit down with them and say to them, this is wrong. And then you have to prove to them. But they, don't, they won't listen to you because they believe, they fully believe that this has an effect. And some people wear this and they are affected by jinn or sihr or ayn. And all of a sudden, they're not affected anymore. They wear this on their neck and they feel a bit of peace. Why did that happen? Why did that happen? Does anyone, anyone know? As all of you today, everyone should know the answer to this. Not just me. Everyone know? No? Yeah. Same with the gin catchers. They go to the gin catcher, Brothers they say they the catch back. your gin. Afwan. Brothers at the back, could you just keep it down please, inshallah. The, the same with the gin catcher, they say we've catch your gin. And then afterwards, the jinn just comes up and says, oh, I was just lying. It's the same thing. They deceive them, making them just wear this because we've done what they wanted you to do is commit shirk. They want you to commit shirk. They want you to go to hellfire. That's the whole purpose. That's, that's what it's all about. It's for you to go to hellfire. And that's what they want from you. So they will leave you alone for a period of time. And if the jinn is really, really rebellious, even against Iblis, you know, devils, they're rebellious against themselves. He will again torment the person. And then he'll go back to, again and get another ta'weez, as you saw as you see here, there's not one ta'weez, there's a few ta'weez. So this person's gone back again. Oh, he's come back. Oh, you need another ta'weez. And he's come back, you need another ta'weez. And he's got a suitcase full of ta'weezes. Isn't it better to carry the Qur'an? If that was the logic, look out and buy a big Qur'an as well. You know, but this is crazy. Uh, so these ta'weezes that have no good but, uh, but evil with them. Okay. Um, can you uh, maybe say a few words on 
magicians such as Dynamo or David Blaine. Obviously, these type of people come on our TV. Uh -huh. uh, people follow these guys on social media, etc. Um, what do you have to say on, on people's like, people like that? Okay, so these magicians, okay, you have to understand the Kuffar, they would love the fact that they have interaction with jinns. Did you know that? They would love to have communications with the unseen world. It's something that is fascinating to them. Uh, and if they can't communicate with the unseen world, they say it's fake, it's not real. Uh, these magicians, I don't think they claim to have the contact with the unseen world. They're, it's all tricks and trickery, and it's very convincing using cameras and uh, TV. Um, but it's all to do with entertainment. Uh, it's why are you watching it in the beginning? Because it does have an effect in the heart. It's your, the question is, my question to you is why are you watching them? You know, why are you watching them? Why are you fascinated by them? You know, did you read the hadiths of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about splitting of the moon? Tell, tell him to split that, the moon in half. You can't do that. So, there's nothing fascinating about them. It's all to do with entertainment and to mislead you and for you to follow them. And the scholars tell you not to watch these kind of things. Have I answered that question? Um, uh, someone's asked a question that a lot of people say that smoking um, and taking drugs, uh, smoking the, the shisha pipe, etc., can have a direct effect with. Uh, Gym possession? No. It can have a direct effect on gin possession and black magic. So is there any evidence to back this up um, or is there any experience? When, when people come to me, I say to them, you know when you're going to you know, commit haram, do you say bismillah before you do that? Do you say bismillah? So when you're just about to smoke, do you say bismillah? And then what's the answer? No. No. And if somebody was to eat food that's halal, what, does, what happens when he eats and he doesn't say bismillah? Shaitan eats with him. Isn't that, doesn't everyone know the hadith? That when you walk into your house and you don't say bismillah, shaitan walks, walks in. And if you sit down and you eat, you don't say bismillah, he eats with you. What about if you commit a haram? We spoke about the, the, the effect of iman, what happens when you commit a sin. It lifts away from you. And the jinns, this is what they say. They say that the, I want, he actually one of them said, I wanted a smoke, so I entered him. But a jinn said that. This is what they say. But this is not for us to fear the jinn. This is for us to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we're disobeying Him and it's what the shayatun were created for so we can run away from them and run to Allah. Do, do you understand? Um, okay, can jinns or do jinns expose themselves to humans? And if so, how? Uh, they do. Uh, especially if they want, to, uh, want you to know they're there. If they're in love with somebody, they would want them to know that they're there. If they want to scare you and terrorize you, they would make you know that they're there. But if they're there just to eat and sleep and just a home to hide in, then they won't let you know. I'm talking from experience now, so this is different. And in what, what format can they, can they expose themselves? What, what? They can do many things, like um, when they're desperate, especially when you start... See, I didn't want to go into this topic, to tell the truth. Uh, look, no, I'll, I'll, I'll say it. When they're desperate and they feel like you're going to get rid of them, they will make sure that you know that that they're there and they're there because they love you and they want to protect you and they want to look after you and they want to do this and they want to do that. It's a real soppy story. They, they say, it doesn't matter if it's a male or female, uh, that's what they'll do. And then if you don't comply, they'll start harming you. That's what they'll do. But not to be scared of them because they can't harm you only by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm asking a question because I'm, they're using uh, the mobile phone, which I, I usually use, so I cannot send uh, a text message. Um, <coughs> Sheikh, would you say that the problem we have in nowadays um, of uh, ta'weed and um, the jinn and all these sort of things, that it's coming because we're not, we don't read the Quran a lot and uh, we don't um, recite the du'a as we usually do because we, we, see, we see in this quite a lot uh, nowadays that we're growing away um, from the Qur'an and Sunnah and we sort of go into other, other things that we, we hope that will uh, answer our problems and our need. Sah, so, I mean, um, you answered the question already. It was, it was clear. You're, 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 it was clear what you said. Most people, unfortunately, and I don't say the, the rows in this room, 
um, that most people like Muslims are not actually not, unfortunately, are not practicing. Uh, they're sitting at home, uh, forgetting their deen and forgetting that identity, and maybe scared even to call themselves Muhammad or uh, Aisha. They're scared to call them names, names uh, you know. So they are far away from remembering Allah Azza wa Jal. And shayateen would easily possess them and easily leave them. It doesn't make no difference to them. But it's unfortunately, it's, well, like I mentioned in the beginning, the brothers that are practicing, brothers are coming to the masjid, what are we doing to help them and call them to Islam and to make them remember Allah Azza wa Jal? Because when we remind others, we remind them ourselves. And this is what, we, this is what the, the ummah is for. It's to call people to Sirat al-Mustaqim. Okay, uh, next question um, is, can you explain to us what a person's repentance should be if they have previously been engaged in black magic, uh, sorry, uh, in, in sihr, uh, or, you know, they've uh, engaged with a jinn um, and they've repented from it afterwards? What, what should be the process? What should the person do? Okay. So if you've done sihr and you've actually harmed somebody, you need to, uh, to ask Allah Azza wa Jal, to forgive you, obviously, to repent from that. But if you've done sihr to somebody to harm them, then uh, you need to give them their rights back. But obviously, if you told them that, they would, you know, they would get really angry. So you have to do it in a very, um, a very uh, wise way. Um, that's one thing: is to give the person's rights back. Secondly, is to repent to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and not not commit that crime again, and totally ask Allah Azza forgiveness, and Allah Azza wa will forgive you. Uh, if you have interaction with jinn. Uh, ignore it totally, pretend they don't exist Even though they exist, we know that believe. But ignore it out of your head If you hear the waswas, if you hear them talking to you Or if they come to you in your dream Just keep reading the Quran, making dua to Allah Azza wa Jal. After a period of time, they will leave you alone um, If you don't know who did the Ain uh, Obviously the answer to your previous question was you take the you can ask the person for the the water from their wudu or but if you don't know who actually did the ain in the first place then what should be your your method of uh, of treatment allah the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to aisha seek ruqya he said to her seek ruqya he didn't say her, he didn't say to her do ruqya he said seek ruqya ruqya is for ain okay and it was allowed and there's specific hadiths that say seek ruqya from ain so do ruqya for instance read in qul wallahu ahad qul a'udhu bi falaq and blowing on your hands like this and wiping over your body is ruqya or asking somebody to do ruqya for you is nothing wrong with that okay it could be your mother it could be your father or your brother or anyone uh, in your family um, and that should get rid of it regardless of where it's coming it depends how strong the ain is people are in a rush to get the cure thinking they're going to get cured straight away when they get the ruqya done sometimes it takes time and there are certain signs and symptoms when the eye leaves. This is what I explain to people when they come to me. Because what they do, they go in a state of despair. Um, so the ayn is, is like, as I explain to them, it's like in layers. In layers. So when you walk somewhere, like you go to a shopping mall and you look like a Muslim. And people look, oh, there's a Muslim. Oh, look, there's a Muslim. Oh, look, there's a Muslim. Not to get paranoid, but it's a natural thing, isn't it? For people to look, oh, he's got a beard. Oh, he's got, um, you know, a thobe. People are looking at you. They're giving you the eye. But you don't realize that. So you're getting affected, but you don't know. So there's layers on top of layers on top of layers of the eye till you get really ill, and then it has an effect on you. Okay? So what you need to do every time you go back home is practice the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and do ruqya to yourself. By, before you go to sleep, you read the quls, you wipe over your body, and that takes away the layers that are there. And the signs are you might start vomiting. Okay? That's the sign of the eye leaving your body. And most people say, you have sihr, if you start vomiting, it's not. Okay, so sometimes you might start suffering from diarrhea, and that's the way your body is detoxing itself. Or doing hijama every month is another way of getting the bad negative stuff that's in your body, i.e. the ain. So reading the quls and wiping over in your body is a ruqya to get away with the effects of the ain and other elements as well. Um, is it permissible to recite over water uh, and drink that water with, with the ayat of, of the Quran? Yes, it is permissible. The Salaf done that. Yeah, and it's permissible to write it as well with, with pure, uh, like ink, I edible ink. It's allowed to do that as well. Saffron. Yeah, as long as you do it yourself, don't get anyone else to do it, especially peers and mola and all these other, um, you know, soothsayers. Don't get them to do it for you, whatever you do. Jazakallah okay. uh, khair. Can jinn or sihr uh, problems of, of, of the sort be passed down through generations? 
Is that, is that something to say? Allahu alam. Uh, it can be, as they've said, that when somebody, for instance, is going to die, they get this, the, the parents. So the person's just, his parents are going to die, and then they will find um, a suitable body to possess. So they possess people for generations over generations. And Allah, Allah alam, but this is what they say, and I can't verify that again. That's just words from the jinn. So I can't, Allah alam. Okay. Um, there's a bit of a long question. I'm going to read it direct from the, from the message. Uh, my question is my sister has had OCD for 15 years. Many years ago, my parents tried to help her but didn't have the correct knowledge. So they invited my Arabic teacher, who I know practiced magic. He gave many ta'weed to hang around the house and put candles outside, that, uh, outside the house um, that were buried under the soil. Uh, many years later that I, I realized this was wrong, I found some of them and threw them away. Um, also, the teacher wrote some grids on plates and asked my sister to eat from those plates. Could the effect still be there even though uh, we threw the taweed away? Also, I know where the teacher lives. Should I contact him for any information to undo the magic? No, no, no. This person, you should stay away from. Uh, this is how people go crazy. When you go to people like this who do set again, on top of somebody who's mostly suffering from Ain, and you go to a magician who starts calling other jinns, and they call so called Muslim jinns. They call them Wakils, and they're tribes who are, are not Muslims. Okay, they are Shayateen, and their whole job and purpose is to mislead the Ummah of the Prophet. Their job is to mislead the Ummah of the Prophet. So they come to somebody who's like an Imam, and they'll say they'll help him, okay, and they'll show him some help, but then they'll stop making him practice magic. And it will be with Qur'an, but it will be just like candles. Qur'an will be written on candles, buried underneath the ground. And many people, many Raqis are misled by this, and they fall into the traps. After a while, what happens to this man, this Mawlan or Peer, whatever he is, it won't work in it for him anymore. This magic won't work for him. So they say to him, you have to slaughter. You have to slaughter something. Or the king of the tribe has got killed, and another king has took hold of, of the tribe, and you have to obey. And the story goes long, on and on and on and on, till they get him worshipping shaitan. But the sister, the question back to the sister is stay away from this man. Uh, this man sounds like he's practicing sihr and don't ask him anything. Don't tell him you're doing ruqya. Uh, just change your number. Um, are there different types of jinn and how can we differentiate between them if there are? Why do you want to do that? <laughs> that, doesn't make it. that question it's not me, that. Akhi, it's not me. Yeah, that's irrelevant. I've made bara from them, alhamdulillah. Go on, next question. Uh, in countries such as Turkey, almost every shop has the blue eye symbol uh, placed somewhere. Why is this and what harm can it bring? Uh, like I said earlier on, these uh, things like the, uh, the eye, the blue eye, and things, this is, sh this is according to shirk that it's going to protect you. Nothing protects you, only Allah is your protector. But once you rely on something, you're left to it, i.e. you have no iman, your iman has become very weak, and you relied on it, so the shi'ati now can do whatever they want to you because you don't rely on Allah, you rely other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, somebody has asked, uh, shi'ati has no power um, other than Allah. I believe that there is no God but Allah. Why is it that Allah, and Allah does not help the wrongdoers, but why is it that this still happens? This is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He tests you, what are you going to do? Are you going to run to him or are you going to run to a, a soothsayer or a magician? So it's a test, just like any other illness. When you're afflicted with some form of illness like sihr and ayn uh, or jinn possession, is what Imqayim said. He said this is just like any other affliction. It's nothing different from um, you know, a broken leg or anything of the sort. Um, I think we're, we're pretty much done for questions, alhamdulillah. Um, if there's any more from the floor, if anyone wants to ask, can I just make clear, just before, I, uh, Raqis are not scholars. I, I, I think all of you are wise, yeah? Raqis are not scholars, and I'm only speaking for experience. So, inshallah, I didn't make any mistakes, and Allah knows best. And if I made any mistakes, it's for myself and shaitan, but anything that from the Quran, alhamdulillah, it's clear. But I just need to make sure that everyone understands that as Raqis, we are not scholars, okay? Zakullah Khaifa asked me the questions and given me a chance to answer, but Really, it's a big amana, this knowledge, Islam and Iman and Ihsan, it's knowledge that needs to be preserved by scholars. 
and we should always turn to scholars. Wallahi, when you look at the fatawa they, they, they make, it makes a lot of sense when you see what I see. Wallahi, uh, you know, brothers, you know, seek knowledge from the scholars. Say you got a limited uh, duration, or is it expired, or some of them they have long duration. The, 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 the magic, yes, the, the magic. So, the, the have a, have a okay. Period. So, you're asking me a question again. I'm gonna refer things like I don't like talking about this, yeah, but I'll, I will say what, what, uh, what I've learned. Um, and there's lots of stuff that I've been told, and I try my best not to do these talks and talk about what the jinn say. But this is what they say they say that sometimes when the magician dies, the sihr is finished. Okay? The sihr is finished. But what you find is that jinns like the body and want to stay in the body. So the sihr hasn't finished yet. And some of them are stubborn and they want to just finish the job, even though the magician has died. And remember, the whole goal of them is to turn you away from the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Husband and wife were separated, and the wife started, ex-wife, started cursing husband in very bad curses, like pushing death, disability, problem with business, not marrying again. It is similar to Syria, but he, he, he feels it, by the way. It's gone wrong after this. And we, like, See, I'll ask you what country they're from. I'll ask you what country they're from, so I know the culture. That's the thir first question I'll ask you. No, no, you don't have to answer. Okay. I'll ask you what they're, where they're from. Then I'll ask you, do you have any suspicion that she goes to magicians? And then, then the answer. Then if you say no, there's no suspicion, then I'll say, okay, maybe, maybe, again, see? I don't say it is. Maybe it's hasad. Okay? I can't just say it's sihr. Unfortunately, many brothers uh, that go or sisters go to Raqqas, they say, you have sihr, you have sihr, when they don't have sihr. If you said that envy can have the same, like... Envy is stronger than sihr. Okay, but uh, hatred and curses... Yeah. Like envy also. Negative. No. Envy can be envy. No, for her it's hatred to No, but the person who's affected should not listen to any of her what she's doing and just rely on Allah Azza and keep making dua and get on with his life. But still it's similar because he feels affected factually, but not happening. Well the, the the sir is that there's a hadith that you should not tell, you know, people your business. So this his ex wife should not know anything about him for him for her to envy him about his you know, his life. Doesn't sound like a case for me. It's not a case. It's it's not a case. This is just sounds like a, a feud between a husband and wife. Like you said, guy trying to do business is like like a wall. He's yeah. trying to marry like a wall. It's, chronically, it doesn't happen. But besides, it's no, no I would say to him, read Surah Al-Baqarah every day. Read Surah Al-Baqarah every day. You'll find your life change. And this is the hadith of the Prophet Sallam. Surah Al-Baqarah has got barakah in everything. Your life, your wealth, your family, everything. So read Surah Al-Baqarah. Ignore what she says and read Surah Al-Baqarah. Uh, Sheikh Abdul Karim. Um, one simple question. Once you uh, dissolve the... Uh, the ta'weez? Yeah, in the water and the paper, how do you dispose of them? So That's it. Just repeat the question. The, the question is, once the ta'weez has been put in water, how do we dis dispose of this? Uh, once it's, you can burn it, okay, you can burn it. No, once it's dry, you can burn it, but that takes, f without water, just take the water out, dry it, burn it. Um, that's one way. The other way is just to throw it in the underground so no one else can touch it and it can't be, uh, no one can basically get it. Just bury it or flush it down the toilet. Well, just put it in the grass, put it in the soil, and that's it. Pardon? You can put it in the toilet, that's it, it's finished, done. Yeah. That's, that's no effect, inshallah. Uh, in the first time, sometimes it's complicated. If the case is complicated, then uh, it's not easy. But if it's straightforward, if it's straightforward, for instance, they tell you what's wrong with them, you ask them questions, and then they, um, uh, how can I, I need to give you an example for you to understand. Uh, let's say somebody comes to you and they go into university. And I'm going to make you guess, because this is what I do, I teach people how to diagnose people. Um, so if somebody goes to university, and then all of a sudden he can't go to university, and this actually happened to somebody who came to me. Um, 
every time he's just about to go to university, he start, his heart starts palpitation, he starts sweating, and he starts panicking. And what do you think is wrong with him? <coughs> hmm? Ain. Ain for what? Ain for what? Now we're going to go to Pacific. Ain for what? Pardon? Knowledge. Yeah? So let's say, for instance, you are, now the next question is, how, what are your grades like? He will say to you, I, get, I got all A stars. Do you, you say to him, did anyone admire you? Did anyone um, praise you? So yeah, a lot of teachers praised me. This person is suffering from what? Ain, because the kuffar don't say, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. So what has he got? He's got Ain. And Ain has got certain signs and symptoms, and they're very severe. And the people that suffer from Ain, they get possessed, uh, I from the, the worst types of jinn. And they cause... Uh, you know, like with swears, the person starts uh, suffering from, um, uh, com um, you know, when you wash your hands too many times, and you can't stop washing your hands, OCD. Okay, they suffer from these kind of symptoms. You know, to us as Iraqis, we know straight away what he has. But it doesn't mean he doesn't have sihr. It doesn't mean that he doesn't have ain. It can be, you can have all the three together, or he can just suffer from ain. But it's, uh, as a, a practitioner, you should ask a lot of different questions, and then uh, you can get to the root of the problem. Okay, um, so if you ask the uh, peer or Mawlan, he'll say to you, yes, there is. Okay, but we know to way to destroy it is to find it and then undo it and then it's destroyed. If you can't find it, was you here early on in the talk? Yeah, you weren't here in the talk. We, aren't, we said that. That was the, like the main part of the talk. The steps of breaking the sihr. Okay, so the brother is saying, how do you break a ta'weez if somebody's told you that they've done a ta'weez for you, but it's not in the country, it's somewhere else, it's high in a mountain, on a tree, and so on, yes? Okay, so the, the thing is, the ta'weez, what was the ta'weez for, number one? You, you want to know what the ta'weez for. So if it was something malicious, and something like to kill you or to destroy your life, they won't tell you where it is. It's very important what it's for, it's very important. Okay, so let's say for instance this here, this, this magic was done, this, this magic was done, what was it for, what was it for? It was for to heal the person, okay? And these Mawlanas, they believe that this sihr is, uh, or they don't believe it's sihr, they believe it's just a way of seeking help from the jinn. So if the person carries these with them, the jinn will possess them. They got like a door to open, yeah, just method of talking. Um, so th they've got it at home. But if a sihr is done to you, not the way you've explained it, because that doesn't make sense. But a sihr was done to you to kill you, to destroy you, and they've hid it in a mountain somewhere far away. What we say to people is make dua and make dua, give sadaqah, do good deeds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will destroy it for you. There are many times we've broken sihr, we don't even know who sihr is for. So it's just dua and having yaqeen, and we mentioned this earlier in the talk, have yaqeen that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer your dua. And once you do that, bi idnillah, Allah will destroy that sihr. And it's happened. It's not like it's not happened. I think uh, we'll take two more and then inshallah we'll, we'll, we'll say we've got some food. Uh, if we pray five times daily, first salah, we do this uh, in a sunnah askar, like reading ayatul kursi in Quran, with Bala Quran, Bina. Uh, and we worry about it because it's already protecting us. Okay. Is it okay to, I mean, we, we shouldn't be worried about it? See, if I answer that question and say to you, you're protected and that's it, then, then you do get afflicted. You say, well, why have I prayed and I've made my dua and why am I afflicted? But you are not to ask Allah why you're afflicted. You have to check to yourself why and what have you done? Because remember, the Prophet Sallallahu the most perfect man to walk on this earth, who had the strength of a hundred men, was afflicted by sihr. Why was he afflicted by sihr? Ask yourself that question. He was afflicted by sihr as it was a test. It was a test, not only to the Prophet ﷺ, but to all of us. And he's an example for us, that we must be patient at a time of test. And we must call upon Allah Allah loves when you call upon Him. 
So this is sometimes the problem I get with, with people when they come. They say, well, I was praying and I made dua and I'd done this and I'd done sadaqah and, and I still got afflicted. Well, be patient. You'll get rewarded if you're patient. And maybe Allah wants a place for you in higher in paradise that you can get to with your deeds and your dua and your... But with your patience, you could. Yes? Is that okay? Okay, let me let me explain this. Okay, I'm not gonna give you like a textbook what are the signs are. I mentioned earlier, um, everyone is different. So like one person, like yourself, would be different to my friend over here. And your signs will not be the same as his. Um, you might be, you know, he might be just naturally kind to his wife, naturally. And, and even the sihr, you know, affected him, but he's still kind to his wife. But with you, on the other hand, are naturally not nice to your wife, just naturally. But just, just the way you are, just because you're aggressive, you've got a temper, naturally. So I have to ask questions to find out, and each individual what they're like to get to the root of the problem. You can't just say, like I said, you can't pick up a book and start diagnosing people. And there are books that have been written, but you can't do that. But what I say to people when they come to me is that, you know the problem, you know the problem, okay? You know you have a problem, there's a problem there. Then why is it still going on? Why don't you fight against it? Remember, sihr doesn't have the effect only by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you know the sihr is there and it's sihr for separation, why don't you just hold hands? Because when you do that, it actually destroys the sihr. When you try to bring that love back together, it actually destroys the sihr. And that's how we actually help brothers and sisters. Okay? The, uh, am I making sense? I hope I am, because I know it is very confusing. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Dave, uh, is there any other um, tips or anything else you'd like to impart on the brothers? Well, 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 we put Continuously, if you are worried about this, that we've got sad with this. Can't we feel that we are actually in you know, a way obsessed with this and worrying about this all the time? <coughs> and then this we is get worried all the yeah, time. This I is believe that everyone just trust Allah so and just do zikr all the time. I think that's been the, the, this, kind of the theme of the This whole, is the whole talk. The whole talk was about this. It's the people are so, you know, they're bothered about somebody done sihr to them. And this is a woman who came to me. She calls the magician, she calls him, phones him, and asks him, um, Did somebody do sihr to me? And he said, Yes, your cousins did. And then she'll come to the raqi and say, Can you do ruqi for me? Can you believe that? Can you believe that? This is how they, some people, they're so worried. But when you're worried, what are you supposed to do when you're worried? What is that you're supposed to do? It's totally turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Totally turn to Allah azza wa jal. When you get attacked, for instance, at night, when you get attacked, what are you supposed to do the next day? Or at that night, what are you supposed to do? Get up and pray, make wudu, make dua, and know there's something wrong. You must have done something wrong. Okay? Okay. Can I can I cut you and explain to you something? Okay. Some people who are afflicted by jinn can talk like this, okay? And they cause mischief in the communities. But they are afflicted by jinn. And it's their jinn. One second, one second. I, I'm gonna explain it. We need it, to wrap up after this. Okay, so people sometimes who are afflicted by a jinn, and you no one knows it, it looks like a mental illness. Go around talking to every single one in the masjid, okay, everyone in the masjid, and everyone knows his news, and it's a jinn actually who's talking to you. It's a jinn that's trying to cause fitna, okay? And he talks about who gave me Ain, he gave me and everyone wants to say, oh, Ain is not real, it doesn't exist. Ain does exist. It takes a man to his grave. It does exist. And there's a cure for it. So we can't, you know, we have to have a balance. Okay, that person needs to be sat down, spoken to, said Tim Akhi, calm down. Okay, yes, Ain is true, and you know what? We'll give you ruqya, or we'll do ruqya to you, or uh, we take the water from everyone in the machine, we we'll give you to wash from it, and done, finished. Don't talk about it anymore. That's it. Jazakallah khair, uh, brothers and sisters, for coming. Um, just two very small announcements. Firstly, we have these books uh, upstairs and at the back of the brothers' section. 
uh, on your exit, it, it's private demo- uh, devotions, uh, morning and evening athqar from the, from the Sunnah of the Prophet Um It has the meanings in there, which is very important, so you know what you're actually reciting. Please take one, make a donation if you want to. Um, if not, but this, the, the, all the money raised from these are going to support our events coming up, inshallah. Um, so yeah, that, that, that is, and obviously with the topic, this is your protection, inshallah. So please take one on your way out. Um, final announcement, uh, we'd like to launch the Ta'weeth project. Um, it's a project that we've been working on, alhamdulillah, we've got some uh, very dedicated brothers on, on, the, on the project. Um, and it's essentially to rid the ummah of things like this, what we've been seeing today. Um, please check out the website, uh, ta'weethproject.com. Um, the Facebook page and the LinkedIn, uh, sorry, the um, Instagram, in, Instagram page. Uh, and essentially it's, it's to get rid of this problem that Ta'weeth has been, become so common within society. Um, unfortunately, and people like the, the uh, brothers um, Abu Nadir said, you know, people trust the, the Ta'weeth so much uh, and it takes them away from, you know, praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and asking Him for help. Um, so please visit the website. Um, check it out, get involved if you can. We're going to have ta'weeth boxes amongst many uh, masajid uh, where people can drop these ta'weeth off and we can open them and, and dispose of them. Um, if you'd like to get involved, contact us via, via the, the, the website or the Instagram and the Facebook. Barakallahu feek once again for coming. We have samosa and some other refreshments, so please help yourself. Um, don't want you to, guys to go home hungry. Jazakumullah khair. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Shadun Laila illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu.